Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to be here and to moderate this afternoon session. Um, as usual, when you take the session mid-afternoon and close to lunch, you always want to bring a lot of energy, but that's not us. <laughs> we will rather tap into your energy. So this is one of those sessions where we will be asking questions of the audience when we're done. So if you don't think you want to get called, this might be a good time for you to figure out how to get us, you know, one of those things that actually make us look away from your direction. So if everyone's settled, we might, we might want to get started. A good way to get started is to, for you to get to know the participants here and the, the panelists. So I'll start with Jenna, and then we'll go down. Hi, I'm Jenna Kundi. I'm the Global Sustainability Director at Johnson Controls. Hi, good afternoon. Mark Densler, I'm President and CEO of the Illinois Manufacturers Association. We're a statewide trade organization representing about 4,000 member companies, and from the Boeings and John Deere's and Caterpillars down to small startups. Afternoon, everyone. I'm Ryan Hackler, co-founder and CEO of Eternal Upcycling. We're a startup out of MHub uh, and Chain Reaction Innovations over at Argonne National Lab focused on developing a technology for recycling single-use plastic waste. Good afternoon. I am Petros Sofronis from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, Grainger College of Engineering. I am also the founding director of the International Institute for Carbon Neutral Energy Research, an institute co-hosted by Kyushu University in Japan and our Grainger College of Engineering, and whose mission is the hydrogen economy. Well, welcome. Um, my name is Sonia Laboa, and I lead strategy and sustainability for Exelon. It's a large transmission and distribution utility with a presence in the Midwest and the Mid-Atlantic. Um, we have quite a lot of questions to get through, and probably 40 odd minutes. We'll do our best to create the space for us to take some audience questions if possible. But if not, it's probably because we are trying to make sure we hit everything possible and we have a controlled discussion. Um, so I think a good place to start when talking about sustainability is you know, we're all aware that most companies have some form of sustainability reporting. Uh, my company puts out a corporate sustainability report every year. And the biggest question is most of what we do is volunteered information. Because it's volunteered, we report according to certain standards and we report certain metrics. Over time, we've seen a lot of like push towards regulation and standardization of sustainability reports. And last week, we saw the SEC basically put out a ruling that guides how, how we make disclosures around climate-related um, financial events for investors to understand. Now, with this push from mandatory reporting to what I would call regulatory reporting, it means a lot of folks have to really think about what they do in sustainability space. And I wanted to open that up to the panel first. Like, what does the most recent SEC ruling mean to you in terms of like any increase in expectations around your disclosures on sustainability? Sure. So um, I didn't describe Johnson Controls. So Johnson Controls is a global corporation, um, a smart buildings company. So we are about a $25 billion company in about 150 countries. And um, we help buildings become more uh, digitized, uh, climate friendly, sustainable, healthy. Um, and we have been doing uh, sustainability reporting for about 20 years now. So we have um, a long run rate for that, but we have been, um, because we're in all these different countries, we're also subject to some European rules. C CSRD is a new one there. Um, we have some rules in Spain we have to do, in um, Ireland, and you know, various countries around the world that we're subject to. And now this SEC rule, and I will say for us, and for lots of companies, there's just more focus, right, on that climate accounting. 
So we have actually moved our um, climate accounting. So what that is is like what are your emissions internally and what are your emissions externally from our sustainability team to our finance team so that we uh, want to be sure that we have, you know, investor ready um, climate metrics, and we do now. So we've done a long internal audit process, and we get our uh, metrics externally audited, but really paying attention to those numbers internally. And then there's just one other thing, and then I'll pass it down, and that is um, your climate-related risks. So we're finding our investors more and more are saying that climate risks are their investment risks. And so they really want to see, are you thinking about the impacts of climate change on your business? What are those risks? What are those opportunities? And how are you managing those risks? So, because, you know, investors, as you guys probably well know, want to invest in low-risk companies. So, and, and, and I think it means different things to different companies based on how large they are and where they stand in the supply chain. Um, as Jenna said, if you're an OEM, an original equipment manufacturer, sophisticated, multiple countries, you know, you have the ability to, to really see what you produce or use. And when you think about scope one, two, and three, the way I like to say is, is scope one are your direct emissions. What your facility is creating, you kind of control it, you know it. Scope two are kind of your indirect. And so when you think about bringing energy into your building, you know, is it generated from renewables? Is it a coal plant? Is it a gas plant? Um, and then scope three, which um, Sunny really talked about that the SEC kind of pulled back on, are really what I would consider downstream. And so if you think if you're a supplier and you're an American company and you're bringing a supply in maybe from Europe or from Asia, you know, you may not know exactly what their carbon inputs are, their outputs are. And so there was a lot of pushback um, from manufacturers with reporting to scope three just because it's tedious, expensive. They may not, it may not even be able to show it. If you're, again, if you're uh, bringing in a supplier from overseas and you're trying to figure out what that is. And so, you know, it's really a balancing act because when you look at what manufacturers are doing, as we like to say, we want to decarbonize, not deindustrialize. And what are manufacturers doing? They're building the smart grid and electric vehicles and renewable energy um, and on and on. And so there has to be that careful balancing act. But what we find, particularly for the smaller companies, the, the tier two, three, or four, they really struggle to kind of meet some of those goals and figure it out because larger companies have a lot of expertise, a lot of staff. The smaller companies are focused on making their widget and making their payroll. And unfortunately, sometimes, you know, the carbon reduction emissions they just don't have the scope, their breath to deal with it. Yeah, I would agree 100% with that. And I will just position myself in terms of a startup and, and trying to be a, a service provider for a means of reducing those scope three emissions. There's a lot of unknowns there. There's unknowns in, as you were saying, what exactly a larger corporation is responsible for in terms of those scope three emissions. But then how do you actually tactically reduce those emissions? It's a big unknown. I think part of the concern there is if we're a bit unclear in the accuracy of that kind of reporting, and we're also unclear as the best means to mitigate those those emissions and hopefully reduce them. You know, there needs to be some more structure and, and means of, of actually tackling that effectively. Right. Yes, I would move it to the next level above the structure by arguing that this will generate a lot of data. It will generate massive amounts of data. There will be called uh, to analyze this data, a lot of analysis teams, financial teams, uh, engineers, etc. But again, it will be the data from the old model. Yeah. And sustainability has to do with moving the needle. Yeah. I'm not sure that this will move the needle. I believe the needle will be moved by innovation, especially when we talk about startups. Startups are essentially what, what we say the, the new blood to elevate what our energy system is, for instance, right? to change that's, the energy system. So That's, that's great. And I, I'll put a pin in that because I think we're going to come back to that very point shortly. Now, as we move from a world where people are basically declaring information on a voluntary basis, and we're going to a world where you're mandated to disclose it in your financial statements, um, I guess the big question is, 
is sustainability here to stay or is it more a fad and we expect to see a bit more pullback because we're now in a world where there is more scrutiny and I know we've started this conversation by focusing on like regulation and landscape but the point here is this everyone wants to do what's best one of the best ways to do it is to attack you know greenhouse gas emissions and companies want to show how they progress on that journey now they disclose that in different ways and the disclosure of that tends to lend itself to how investors think but now that you're being asked to disclose certain information are we expecting a pullback in any way shape or form what do you think Jenna? i would say if is sustainability here to stay no question yes yes absolutely yes so what we are seeing, so for example, Johnson Controls just did a, a commission a study, Forrester, who uh, worked with 3,500 different um, companies and the leaders, the decision makers there, asking them what their business priorities are. And one of their top business priorities was sustainability. Um, they're really, companies across the board, across the globe are setting really ambitious goals around sustainability and they're really driving how to get there. Governments, um, so uh, in Illinois, for example, so one of the services that Johns Controls provides, uh, there's some folks in the audience here, can do energy assessments and then actually help get your company money from the government because um, the governments are really trying to meet the terms of like the Paris Agreement and these uh, UN Climate Accords. They just did um, you know, a COP28, which is the UN Climate Change Conference. Um, 195 countries came together and they said, how are we doing? It was the first, what's called global stock take, which is where the countries actually say, how are we doing? And the point is not enough, not fast enough. And so now they're recommitting to, okay, we have to do more. And so countries are putting into effect lots of um, incentives, financing the IRA in the United States, lots of money here in Chicago is an example of that. And in addition, we're finding, you know, you name it, customers are demanding it, our investors are demanding um, sustainability across the board. Again, the climate risk is um, investor risk. And uh, even employees, so employees are working for companies that they believe are more sustainable, and then they're staying if they find that they actually are, so that um, retention rate is higher if that company actually is more sustainable. That's great. And I would echo, absolutely, sustainability is here to stay. Our sector, you know, too many people have this perception of cogs and belching smokestacks, and, and all of you know, Manufacturing is sustainable and high tech and automated and clean. Um, I like to say you can go on the factory floor and eat off the floor a lot of times. It's, it's not what people envisioned years ago. And, you know, we have a great story to tell. When you look at manufacturers, according to data, we've reduced emissions more than any other sector since 1990. Why? It's the right thing to do. Um, you want to save money, particularly when it comes to energy, um, because that's a very expensive cost proposition. So, I like to say manufacturers are environmentalists. They care about sustainability. They care about the world, zero waste, zero water. Um, so clearly, I, I agree with Jenna. It is here. It is here to stay. It's all that transition. Um, you know, is it the carrot or the stick? You can look at the clean car standard, for example, where California wants to prohibit the sale of internal combustion engines by a certain date. Here in Illinois, the governor doesn't want to go that far. He'd rather use the carrot versus the stick, so to encourage people. And so... We need to make sure there's just a good partnership. Um, I, I'm one, too many mandates. We don't want to kill innovation. We want to be careful that the small companies or others can innovate. So there just has to be that partnership and that careful balance as we transition. But clearly, it's here to stay. That's great. And I, I come back to the point that, you know, the beachhead issues are usually like the environmental issues. So we're talking about climate here. But in trying to solve a climate crisis or a climate challenge, you know, we it would involve a massive amount of spend. Um, it would also involve a way to socialize that spend where we have to ensure that society or the fabric of society is not destroyed and they are, while trying to push you know, this um, you know, reduction of greenhouse gases in the air. So it brings me to uh, more of a secondary question here, which is 
government is willing to underwrite a lot of this spend, like you pointed out, there could be opportunities for different sectors to take advantage of this. Because as you push to decarbonize the economy, you're going to see a lot of sector coupling. I'll give an example. I am from the electric sector. We have a view on how decarbonization should happen. You should clean up the electric grid. You should power economic activities with the ele clean electricity through electrification. You should make sure that you're using it efficiently, which is energy efficiency. And then ultimately, you should, for areas that are hard to electrify, you should try to use clean fuels. That's a thesis that works. That's how we think about it. But in all of the segments, there would be opportunities for different players. So I want to start from the back end. Petrus, you talked about innovation. How do you see innovation playing a role in this push towards decarbonization in a manner that doesn't create social problems? Yes. From the university, from the university perspective, I would say that the younger generation the 18-year-olds, the 20-year-olds are craving for sustainability. In other words, it is not whether it will stay or not. It, it has to stay, and the, 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 the kids at our campuses, they do believe in sustainability. In fact, uh, all, most of the design projects that we have, that we assign to our seniors, are related to sustainability. I can give you an example, for instance, uh, a team of our undergraduates designed the cooling system of the petascale machine that the University of Illinois had uh, a few years ago, had established along with the IBM. In other words, again, I'm going back to innovation. The younger generation is, is ready, is ready to innovate, and uh, is looking forward for our leadership to allow them to innovate. So That's great. <laughs> uh, maybe that will be a good segue into your question, Ryan, and then I'll come back this way. Like, what <clears throat> emerging technologies are you basically considering, I mean, looking forward to seeing play a role? I know you are in a startup, and what does that really mean, and how do you think about technology? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, going to the overarching existential crisis that is climate change, it's incredibly multifaceted. There's not a single solution, and it really takes innovation across every front. As you're saying, from electrification of, of various machinery and applications to plastic recycling, all these different types of goods. It's not just about the amount of CO2 that each company is spewing out, but it's the access and the availability of materials. And I think ultimately it goes back to you know, the earlier question of is sustainability here to stay? My stance on that is a little bit more pessimistic, but I think ultimately in the same spot, which is it will continue to stay so long as there's that drive. And as you were saying, the younger generation, the innovators that are trying to come up with solutions, they will make it stay because they are trying to find a means to bring this out and have a good impact. As Jenna was saying, the investors, the consumers, the different stakeholders across these different types of industries, they have the drive and they want something to come into play here that will make everything far more sustainable and equitable for everybody. And I think that's what's going to come into play, especially as we look at these different types of innovations, because we're kind of done with the way of thinking this is just how it's been for the past 100, 120 years since the Industrial Revolution and beyond. So we're just going to keep doing it like this. There's this kind of philosophical change in everybody to say, let's take a step back as to how this started and just look at how should this be done, and then we'll work from there. And I guess I just want to add just a little bit about the innovation thing, too, and just how important all of your work is. So it is just really true that, right, the city of Chicago has these sustainability goals, and they honestly, they probably don't know how they're going to achieve them. Um, corporations around the world are setting really ambitious sustainability goals. They need help achieving them. C countries, municipalities, you name it, they're setting these sustainability goals and now they're going after them and they're going, oh, we need cool, amazing technology to make these things happen. So at Johnson Controls, we committed to at least 75% of our R&D spend to be around sustainable technologies, and we're spending more than 90% on it because we're just seeing that growth 
in the the demand for heat pumps and the demand for these innovative products that are going to help us move toward electrification, move towards sustainability. And, and I think two technologies we really need to watch. And in the first, I was with Laura uh, from the Research Park at U of I, and we met with a couple of startups, is battery storage, right? We all talk about it. Lithium batteries, we went from the internal combustion to electric vehicles. Um, so we use lithium. Well, now there's the discussion of mining and what that carbon is. And so Laura and I had the opportunity, what, a week ago, Laura, to meet with a couple of startups and ones can use limestone in a battery. And we have limestone in the United States, so we don't have to bring it in and worry about geopolitics. And, and so I, I think battery technology, because right now what we capture and we're able to store from renewables isn't as high as we want it to be. So how can we improve that? And then secondly, really, is carbon capture and storage. I mean, the Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, said we can't meet our Paris climate goals without CCS. There's a big debate going on in Illinois right now, but for, for manufacturing sector, whether you're an ethanol plant, whether you're steel, your chemical, your fertilizer, you know, how can we capture that carbon? The Secretary was in California a month or two ago. They can capture it out of the air. And, and so I think CCS, for example, is a technology. It's not going to be the only one, but how do we continue to innovate, allow these technologies so that we reduce them? And what you may reduce in ethanol might be different than steel. And, and so, but again, if we can reduce something by 50 percent, it's better than not doing anything. So I think these technologies will continue to improve. That's great. And, uh, you know, we've talked about innovation, and but we've mostly limited it to technology. I, sitting in my role in strategy, I will tell you this that if we had to build a grid today, we will probably build it differently. And what that means to me is we have something that is over 100 years old and is used to delivering a very low cost product efficiently. But if we were to rethink it today, we will probably need to think about the technologies that support it, which is one part of it. The innovation needs to be in planning, too. Like, how do you think about where people are going to use electricity, how they use it? There needs to be innovation in the business models. There needs to be innovation in, you know, like, regulatory structures. So I guess the point I'm trying to make here for folks in the room is, even if you're not actively engaged in one technology or the other, there's a way for you to be innovative in this energy transition if you can figure out a way to do things differently. You can be really disruptive or enabling, whether it's in technology or business model or finding a way to change how regulatory constructs work or figuring out how to help people plan. You know, and that's what it means you know, to support the energy transition in a different way. Now with that, I'm gonna come to you now, Mark, and I'll ask this question. There's going to be a huge spend you know, what exactly is U.S. manufacturing going to get out of this, and how does this create an opportunity or competitive advantage for U.S. manufacturing, um, you know, with this underwriting of, of innovation, of uh, transition spend here? Yeah, well, first of all, the United, so I, I think American manufacturing has answered every challenge in our nation's history, and, and I think we're going to continue to do it today. We don't know what tomorrow's challenge is, but I, I will bet every day of the week that manufacturers will figure out a way to do it. Um, when you look at the United States, I would say from a, a general level, we haven't really ever had an industrial policy in the country, unlike China and some other countries. And with the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, we really kind of put in place a little bit of industrial policy. You, know, you have to have so much domestic content for some of these projects. And so I'm really bullish on American manufacturing, I think particularly in the Midwest where we have access to a lot of energy, we have clean energy, access to water. So I think first, this region is very well positioned um, to grow and, and take advantage of it. Um, I, again, I just I think the technology government, and I hate to say it's never, but government really doesn't create the solutions. It's the private sector, and so it's the folks at MHub. But I, I think we're going to figure out these answers to battery and electric vehicles in the grid. I mean, when, when you talk about it, Sonny, our, our energy usage, while you talk about energy efficiency, the, the American use of energy doesn't go down in the next 50 years. It goes up. When you think data centers, um, we're involved in a project right now that, that we're hoping to get an announcement here that we're going to have a huge project. It's going to be a huge energy user. 
and and so we're going to have to figure out the grid because the grids, as you say, are 100 years old. And I would just note for those, for example, and, and there's a discussion of no more natural gas. We're not going to have a certain time. Well, I would just say certain industrial processes you can't do with renewables. You can't generate steam, for example. So there, we're not going to hit a time where you just can't have natural gas. But you look at the system, and it is we do electrify, and let's say that you can no longer have a gas stove in, in Chicago, and users fall off the system. You have fewer users, but their costs go up. So how do we then compete with global um, uh, global interests around the world? And I would just end by saying uh, the vice chancellor from Germany was in Chicago this week and had an opportunity to be with him and, and the German ambassador of the US. And a big discussion, particularly German subsidiaries, were the cost of energy in Germany. Well, they had gone to almost a complete renewable and then they figured out it was getting expensive, and then they were relying on gas. And then, of course, you have the whole Ukraine-Russia thing. And, and so they're really chafing. They're having huge energy costs, and they're really seeing deindustrialization right now and the German economy really slowing. So when I talk about that balancing act, it, there, there's not an easy solution. As you said, it's very, very complex, and uh, we, just, we have to encourage the innovation. But I would bet on American manufacturing every day. That's great. That's really great. We've been talking about sustainability for a bit now, maybe 20 odd minutes. And it just occurred to me that a lot of us here are kind of like versed in it. But for someone who wants to just dip their toe or get started in sustainability, maybe you have a business and you're wondering, how do I ensure that I am reporting things the right way? Or, you know, what does it mean to be a responsible corporate citizen? And we've used the term sustainability. If someone wants to get on that journey, you know, where and how should they start? Jenna? Yeah, I guess I would say it does kind of start with the data. So, um, you know, looking at what your impact is, because you, you know, what gets measured gets managed, right? So, um, from a building's perspective, um, so nearly 40% of the um, global emissions are from buildings, and so we really focus on getting data out of buildings, uh, individual buildings and across buildings, so that facility managers can um, really affect uh, change in their buildings to reduce energy. So, that, so for example, the data center thing, we worked um, to switch out some technology so that actually there was a, a really large company, you know, whatever, one of the big ones um, that wanted more data centers, but they couldn't do it because of all the energy they would have used. So they're now using more energy efficient technologies. Anyway, they wouldn't have known that without the data, right? So really getting a handle on your scope one and two data, especially that's your operational emissions. Um, but then as well as you can, even though it's really complicated, um, your scope three data, so that's the um, the indirect emissions, that's from your supply chain, and then also once your stuff leaves uh, leaves your door. But even just that internal um, emissions picture from your buildings, from your fleet, from whatever other kind of emission sources you have is really important place to start. That's great. So one thing I want to add to that as well is um, I think a big thing manufacturers should focus on in particular is supply chain resiliency. Mm -hmm. When you think about, and this kind of touches the previous question as well, when you talk about U.S. manufacturers having a supply chain resiliency and needing to look for something far more sustainable, that's going to come from the U.S. as well when it comes to whether you're talking about battery development with lithium or cobalt or other types of metals. If you're talking about natural gas, if that's still needing to be used in types of industrial processes. For any and all of those, those are also going to come hand in hand with supply chain resiliency. And I think those are the types of things that manufacturers should take a hard look at and say, what opportunities exist or what kind of opportunities can I help facilitate and grow as a means of not only getting to that sustainability route, but also getting to a supply chain resiliency that I can rely on so I don't have to deal with shortcomings in you know, years down the road. Yeah, Sunny, I would like also to add a comment. Uh, which is a continuation to what Mark said about the American manufacturers are always on the lead, right? The American university has been always on the lead. <laughs> okay? The American university has produced Nobels. It hasn't stopped producing Nobels, laureates, right? So the American university is a research resource there that knows how to solve problems. So the manufacturing community should get connected with the academia. 
And in fact, this does happen. For instance, a good example is the recent uh, uh, hydrogen shot by the Department of Energy, right? Uh, one in one in one, right? Yeah. To reduce the hydrogen cost to one dollar per kilogram, right? The Department of Energy thinks this is going to go through the economies of scale. We at the universities believe that this can only happen if you find the science to do that the electrolysis, the catalyst, the catalysis, the materials, and so on and so forth. And all these will change, for instance, how our renewable grid will operate. You can't have the grid operating with renewables unless you have hydrogen storage, because you need long-term hydrogen storage. So in other words, the manufacturers, along with the academia, needs to get together in order to identify what are the critical problems that require solutions. And I believe this is happening. This is happening, and I can give you multiple examples from the University of mm -hmm. Illinois. Multiple examples in this, in this direction. Yeah. Great. It, it, and I would just say really quick, I mean, there, if you're a startup and your question is what could a, a new company do, I mean, as simple as an energy audit, you know, to come around. I mean, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. And then you go upwards, and I don't know if they're here. I mean, last night, Chris Heckel and Megan from Argonne Lab were here. And, for those of you that, that don't know, we're, there are 17 national labs under U.S. Department of Energy in the United States. We're blessed. We're one of three states that have two. We have Fermilab and Argonne. Most people don't understand that Argonne and Fermilab will work with companies for free oftentimes. And so you think all the groundbreaking energy that research that they're doing, and we've had our board there and companies, um, you keep the IP most of the time. A lot of times there's not a cost. And so it's in our backyard. I mean, it's only, you know... 20, 25 miles from here, but you can do partnerships with Argonne and Fermi when you're really talking about the advanced energy. But I know small companies, 10 or 15 employees that partner with Argonne and they leverage the amazing research and brains or you know, folks at the U of I or Northwestern. So there's a lot of resources out there that are available. Yes, and that's a really great point because I think at Exelon, one of the things we did was we created this trifecta of like government agencies like DOE, the national labs, you know, with government GOCOs, and then the universities. And we had like research agreements with all of them. And, you know, it's just been so great. Even if you're a small company, Argonne has things like the chain reactions innovation where they can put you in a cohort and help accelerate your, your, your thinking. But in all, I, I wanted to just put a general question to the panel and then we'll open it up to, to the audience. And if there's none, I'll come back to the panel. What gives you the most concern about where we're headed to in the energy transition and sustainability and how people are thinking about the role of technology. And conversely, what gives you the most cost for optimism, not just concern? So both ends of the, both two sides of the coin, what are you most concerned about and what are you most optimistic about as we go down this path of trying to address greenhouse gas emissions and think about sustainability in general? I'll start with Petros. Thank you, thank you, Sani. Concern that you said, right, we need research. We need, we need innovation that will come out of new research. The industry, the industry in the US isn't investing, as for instance, the United States government is doing, or philanthropy is doing. You hear lately that philanthropy is investing big, even Mark uh, Zuckerberg, right, invested uh, for uh, the so-called uh, hubs here in our state, right, for uh, fermentation, for biotech, and quantum computing, for instance. Through all. Now, we need, we need the industry to, to put the skin in the game, as we say, and, and work with the academia. You see, academia doesn't need a lot of money. I mean, we, we can do things easily because we are hungry for the new things. We are hungry for new solutions. And because we have also the younger generation with us to do it. Uh, Great. Now, regarding uh, what uh, keeps me optimistic, I would say the younger generation, right? Mm -hmm. I see them, they are ready to work with us. They are flooding our graduate programs uh, and we can't keep up with them. So that's, that's the idea. That's great, Ryan. Yeah, um, I do want to uh, mention that as a fellow in Chain Reaction Innovations, I cannot endorse them enough. <laughs> Highly recommend, check them out if you're uh, in the entrepreneurial side and want to look into 
resources that are really accessible and useful for getting good technology up out of the ground. Um, in terms of, I'll, I'll start with the with the pessimistic and then I'll go to optimistic. Um, pessimistic side, I would say um, the speed at which we're trying to adapt. Um, you know, we're, we're creatures of habit. These types of changes in pattern um, are, are pretty difficult to adopt um, quickly. Um, again, as you're saying, whether it's the energy grid that's 100 plus years old or, or other kind of systems, structures set in place, um, we need to adapt faster than, than what we're doing. And the ramifications of not doing that is what we're seeing in terms of uh, temperature increase, the CO2 um, parts per million in the atmosphere. Those are the things that are concerning um, because we do need to act quickly. Um, but on the optimistic side, I know we will do it. Um, and my go-to as a scientist um, is history. If you look at the last 120 years, we've always been ready and come up to the task when it comes to existential environmental problems. If you're looking at the ozone layer in the 1980s, if you're looking at um, the implementation of the catalytic converter because we saw skylines being covered in smog in the 1950s and beyond. If you look at the mass production of fertilizer to feed billions of people beyond what we were able to before, time and time again, we've been able to demonstrate that we can come to this challenge and we will with this, with climate change, with environmental concerns and sustainability. My only concern is we should do it quicker. Great. Um, this will get me in trouble. What scares me are politicians. Um, and I have to deal with them on a regular basis, but politically driven mandates that aren't grounded in fact or scientific fact, um, that really worries me because what, what that threatens to do to the manufacturing sector or other sectors when they set hard lines or mandates that quite frankly you can't meet um, or is a challenge. And I'll just, you know, and I'll only give you an example. In 2007, so 16 years ago or 17 years ago, Illinois created the first renewable portfolio standard that we had to have X percent of renewable energy. And, and then, um, so it was gonna be 20% by the year 2020. So then around 2016, we're nowhere close. And they said, okay, well, instead of rolling it back or delaying it, we're now gonna pass a new law. We have to have 25% by 2025. It's great to have goals, absolutely. Let's aim that way. Well, then about two years ago, they passed another energy and this time, we're nowhere close, and they said, now we're going to have 40% by the year 2030. It's a great goal. Today, we're about 8.5%. So we now have to go from 8.5% to 40% here in six years. Well, for two years ago in law, they then mandated for the first time, you have to have closure of baseload generation, which is coal and gas and others. So what's happened in Illinois, we had a competitive energy market. It was a huge advantage. Well, as soon as the state said, you have to close down by this date, companies that said, well, we're not going to invest in our plants that have to close down in a few years because we're not going to get the return back. We've had early closure of baseload generation. So Illinois, which one had been a net exporter of energy, we're now a net importer of energy. And now we have to have new transmission. So again, it was a politically driven mandate, great aspirational goals, but sometimes the result now is we're losing energy. And for the manufacturing sector that uses one third of it, that creates a, a big challenge. And for Illinois, okay, is a company going to locate here or they're going to locate elsewhere? And so, anyway, my answer is politicians. They just worry that, that they do politically driven things and they don't understand science. What yeah. really excites me is quantum, and I don't know very much about it. I have read Quantum for Dummies, which is a book out there. But Illinois is a quantum leader. We have four of the ten quantum hubs. Um, the governor put $500 million in the budget. We're going to have a right. quantum campus and cryogenics. And I think the ability of what quantum is going to do, whether it is new medicines or other things, I think it's just going to propel the United States forward. And I think Illinois is going to be at the leading edge of that. And, and so that really excites me. Great. Going to bring us home. Um, so in terms of challenges, I'll just um, echo, I think, what everybody has said kind of at, and, and what I heard at COP28, which is like not enough, not fast enough, right? Not meeting these goals. Um, and then in terms of what's exciting is you guys. So your amazing innovations, you're here because you have these cool ideas to make a difference, to change the world, right? Like that's amazing. Um, so, you know, so, so, these things can happen. So John's Controls, like there's a, a, a guy in the audience here from John's Controls, he just went to one of the buildings in Chicago, did an energy audit, they can save more than a million dollars every year. It can save energy, it can uh, you know, save carbon, you know, doing these retrofits, 
you know, making these things happen, you kind of have to have the vision and then go after the vision, right? That's what you guys do. You have this vision, you go after the vision. So, I mean, I think if we attack this climate crisis together with urgency, um, with your amazing ideas, um, with lots, of, with everybody's partnership and cooperation, um, we can do some do amazing it. things. All right, this is where we get to the super exciting part where we get to ask you guys questions. I see David Weinstein is avoiding eye contact. Don't worry, I'm not going to call on you. Uh, I see a few people with their hands up. Hey, thanks for your time. So uh, you think about one way of business to look at sustainability is reducing environmental impact per dollar of revenue earned is kind of one way to think about it. And it's kind of obvious how to do that in terms of scope one and two as far as uh, reducing the impact of the resources used, and then on to re reducing the impact of the manufacturing and distribution process. For scope three, the thing that really has happened is you know circular economies and the recycling of goods and products being resold on secondary marketplaces, especially in e-commerce platforms, is kind of uh, improving that. But businesses haven't really, you know, the primary manufacturers haven't taken a, a huge advantage of that. How do you see the original brands, manufacturers, taking advantage of and getting involved in circular economies in order to kind of reduce overall that North Star metric of the uh, environmental impact per dollar of revenue. Can I take that? Yeah, Jenna and All right. maybe I, Ryan. I've got from both sides. So on the embedded carbon side, for example, so Johns Controls makes a lot of HVAC equipment, so ducts and big chillers and all this kind of thing, so lots of steel. So we have a partnership with Nucor Steel where we're giving them our steel. It's, they have this electric arc furnace technology that uses like 70% less um, energy and emissions than traditional uh, steel making technology. So they recycle our steel, we take it back. So that it's that closed loop thing. So that's on that side. And then on the other side, I mentioned before, we have 75% of our new product innovation is in um, you know new sustainable technology, and we see the shift. We're selling fewer, like big, you know, uh, less energy efficient technology, and more heat pumps. Our heat pump um, market share is really growing uh, all around the world. That's what people are switching to is this, these electric technologies that that are more efficient. So you can kind of have an impact on both. Ryan, any? Yeah, I think the thing that I want to add from my perspective is just when you're talking about very consumer facing manufacturers, they're far more responsive to what sort of changes can be made for them to reduce their scope three emissions because for their products, those are very consumer driven. So this is a bit of a contrast to the regulatory changes where manufacturers are saying, well, we need to get ahead of that. For the conversations that we've had, for example, with manufacturers that are producing very consumer forward goods, they are saying, well, no, we, we want to make these changes not necessarily because of regulations, but because we need a cutting edge in the market. And the consumers, the people buying our goods, are looking for that sustainable edge. And that is what's going to translate for us into more innovations, more access to feedstocks to produce the types of goods that we typically produce, but having a, something far more sustainable. And we're going to try to gear ourselves towards getting that more advanced innovation that happens to be more sustainable. That's great. We can take one last question. Hi, thank you. Um, a lot of discussion in MHump here too is new widgets, the latest, greatest technology, the silver bullet that's going to be coming. What about technology we have today and deploying that? And one example is combined heat and power, mm -hmm. distributive and all that. So could you just talk to why aren't we doing better deploying that? It's a great question. Um, you look at something like carbon capture and storage. It's been around for a long time and proven successful, but it's not yet commercially wide scale. Um, you know, we're working on trying to do that. I mean, hydrogen's been the energy of the future for how long? Um, you know, and hydrogen hubs. But I, I think that's certainly, obviously, part of the answer to it. I, I don't know a good answer about why some of these things aren't commercially out there. You know, sometimes maybe we're a little slower to adapt. Um, 
But uh, no, there's a lot of technology out that, you know, nuclear, for yeah. example. I mean, you want to talk about, you know, zero emission power. In Illinois, about 45% of our load comes from the nuclear plants. You know, we had a ban in Illinois on additional nuclear um, construction. We eliminate this year, and we're not building the brand new plants you think about. It's the small modular nuclear that you can take around. And so, again, the technology has been out there for a long time, but is it something that we can use? And I think we need to do so. I do think a huge function of it is the techno-economic cost as well. For every technology, the adoption curve is usually correlated with the economics. So for things like combined heat and power, you know, sometimes when you have to use a technology like that, you really have to cite it. You have to cite and build it to the heat load and the electric load, and sometimes there's a mismatch. When you have that mismatch, it makes it a little bit more expensive. And you know, the technology cost actually just helps fuel the adoption rate. It's possible that we could do more with existing technologies, but I also think that cracking you know, the cost curve, which is what I think what we should be doing in places like MHOB is is literally going to be that silver bullet. There are certain technologies that have been on the cusp for like forever, and we just need to figure out why aren't they here now. And with that, I want to thank the entire panel for all that they've done, um, and thank you all for listening. <laughs>